Look at Zcash, uh, which launched in October of, of 2016. Zcash's supply will grow by 75% over the next year, uh, which is a massive amount of dilution. And what this means is in order for Zcash's price to, to just tread water, stay flat, its, util its utility has to keep pace with the rate of inflation. Um, and I'm going to dig into this a little bit more. Before I do, I want to say I am a fan of the Zcash project. Um, I spoke with Zuko about this before I did the presentation, and he was excited. He's like, you know, people need to know. They need to be educated about um, the way these things work. And he's concerned that, that people don't look into supply inflation enough. So here is Zcash's network value since inception. Had some, some, some turbulent times, as every early crypto asset does. And if I project out um, into the next 10 years, just using what is publicly known about Zcash's monetary policy, which is very similar to Bitcoin's, then uh, at the end of 2028, I can expect if, if Zcash as the asset appreciates 0%, um, for Zcash to be a $5 billion network. But if I'm a crypto asset investor and I'm earning a 0% expected annual rate of return, then I'm not a very good crypto asset investor. And so really, I would expect something like a 40% um, annual expected rate of return. This is just thinking about uh, the, the discount rates that I used as a uh, high growth equities analyst where the weighted average cost of capital is 10 to 15 percent. You think about the risk of a crypto asset is 3 to 4 to 5x that. So 3x of 15 percent is more like 45 percent. So this would place Zcash at the end of 2028 at roughly a 200 billion dollar network which means you're expecting Zcash to be bigger than, actually much bigger than, than Bitcoin is today. Um, and this is, again, just a thought exercise because these, these assumptions are in the market, right? Well, certainly the, the rate of supply inflation is there. It's baked into the software. And then you all, as investors, um, have your own assumptions, your own expected rate of return, and combining those two, you can project the, the network value, the future network value that you need to, to earn that rate of return. Okay, so that was network value, a relatively simple metric, but the one that is most widely used um, in, in, in the relative valuation comparisons. I'm gonna hop now to ratios. And so with a ratio, this is where we have a numerator and a denominator, and I'll start with a ratio just using two variables, and we can talk about um, more complex ratios at the end. So numerator tends to be a price metric, uh, denominator tends to be a utility metric, uh, and the most common of these uh, right now is the network value to transactions ratio. I get credit often for having created it. I didn't create it, Willy Woo created it um, on Twitter, and I just helped popularize it. And the reason I really liked it and originally called it the crypto PE ratio, though that confused people because crypto networks don't have cash flows, they don't have earnings, um, is because if you think about how a stock is priced in the stock market, it tends to be priced as a multiple of its earnings because earnings are the utility to an investor that holds that stock. Um, similarly, with a blockchain-based crypto network, that base utility is transaction value. And so just as a stock is, is priced as a multiple of its earnings, you can make the argument that a crypto network should be priced as a multiple of its transaction value. And so that's really um, what the NVT ratio does, is it prices um, using transaction value as your utility metric, it prices the network as a multiple of that transaction value. So to uh, decompose how this is actually calculated, um, I'll share some graphs. So here's Bitcoin's network value um, ever since Mt. Gox, Mt. Gox launched, and we had a good price um, on log scale. And so that has um, it's a, a famous chart. And here's a slightly less famous chart of Bitcoin's on-chain transaction value. And so I want to be clear, this is transaction value using Bitcoin's blockchain. This has nothing to do with trading volumes um, on Coinbase or uh, Bitstamp or, or any of the exchanges, although sometimes um, the exchanges do shuttle uh, Bitcoin amongst them, 
to, to clear and settle um, imbalances, and sometimes that is reflected in, in on-chain transaction volume, so that is a, a, a slight um, wrinkle in the data. But we can already see, if we overlay the two, um, how closely they map one another. Um, and it certainly looks like on-chain transaction value is providing some kind of uh, support to network value. So I'm going to divide now the blue line by a 90-day rolling average of the orange line, and that gives me the NVT ratio. And so it's clear that there's this range. Um, it, it looks like it doesn't want to violate 200. It has this base uh, just below 50, an average of 80. And the interesting thing with these ratios is uh, while it's weird to say uh, the fact of the market becomes the future uh, theory of, of tomorrow because these ratios, traders will use them, people will base their investments off of them, and so people will, will tend to treat them as truth if they persist for long enough. Now, I also understand the argument of, well, they work until they don't, and if all of this stuff is worth zero, then this is just an illusion, a mirage. Um, and I, I can understand and empathize with that argument, um, but if we look at other asset classes, these, these patterns tend to emerge and then be respected by the market uh, over time. So the exploration we just went through was really comparing Bitcoin to itself longitudinally over time. Um, but what's more exciting is comparing um, across crypto assets because this is where um, investors, when they're looking, um, for example, within the equities market um, at different industries, they can get an idea of, okay, Facebook is priced at this multiple while Twitter's priced at this multiple and they're both social media companies, so one is more richly priced by the market while another is less richly priced. I think we can do the same with crypto assets, but it's really important um, if we do that we're careful with the data because um, as, as awesome as Crypto Compare is and has been doing for the industry, we're still just building these data platforms and, and learning best practices. So you always have to make sure that, especially if you're pulling data from different platforms, that you're pulling the exact same data um, for price and utility metrics. And even more importantly, that you should be comparing those two assets in the first place. So I would never compare um, Netflix's um, earn, uh, PE ratio to Intel's PE ratio. They're just totally different businesses to the world, just as I would never compare um, Bitcoin's NVT ratio to Ethereum's. Um, I think of Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, Ethereum as a crypto commodity, and they have very different architectures. Um, and so that's, that's an important consideration. So if we very carefully look at the NVT ratios of UTXO based, so unspent transaction output, which is the way the architecture is constructed, cryptocurrencies, then we start to see somewhat of a pattern um, where Litecoin being the silver to Bitcoin's gold is the least richly valued, right? It's the lowest multiple of transaction value. Uh, Bitcoin's kind of right in the middle. You could say D, uh, uh, Zcash is somewhat undervalued because of that, that supply inflation rate. Um, Decred, as a, a newer and, and governance-focused autonomous cryptocurrency, is, slight, is slightly pricier um, based on future expectations of, of what that cryptocurrency will do. And then Dash and Bitcoin Cash kind of appear uh, to be a, a richly valued uh, anomaly based on the utility they provide the world. And so um, this can be done for, for different assets. Um, again, so long as you're, you're careful um, with the comparisons that you're making. Within the relative valuation space, if you look at um, a lot of the other work done around other asset classes, we don't have to stop um, at two inputs. Um, and specifically for crypto, um, what I've just been looking at is uh, uh, based on demand side drivers, so transaction value being um, the, the people using the services, but you can look at supply side strength, supply side being the computers or the humans that are providing the service that the demand side is consuming. Um, and so this would be things like hash rate or number of nodes connected to the network, um, capital expenditure supporting the network, and 
I'll cover some of those now. So in terms of, say, a, a ratio that would use three variables, within um, the equity space, we have the peg ratio, where you calibrate PE for growth. Um, and I think we could do the same if we're careful with the NVT ratio calibrating it for growth. And so this would be something like, OK, in the, in the last slide, Litecoin was priced at 23 times. Um, but if it's only growing at, say, 10%, which is just an arbitrary number, then that, that ratio, that MVT, would be 230. Whereas maybe you take something like Decred, priced at 28 times, if you say, hey, this is growing at, at 50%, then the NVT ratio would be 56. And so when you calibrate for growth, you would actually start to see very different ratios that would show are you over or underpaying for uh, how quickly this crypto network is growing. There's also this NVTT ratio. So um, I said a little bit ago that with the NVT ratio, I don't include trading volume because I don't think, just as um, FX volume is not included in GDP metrics, um, I don't, I typically, or in the NVT ratio, I, I don't include it. But for reserve crypto assets, of which Bitcoin is one, and I would argue Ethereum or Ether is increasingly becoming one, one of the roles of a reserve asset is being used to purchase other assets. And so you could make the argument that one of, uh, that's a utility of, of a reserve crypto asset, and therefore you should have trading volume and transacting volume in the, in the denominator. There's some good work that's being done um, using Metcalfe's law um, metrics in, in the denominator. So metrics, Metcalfe's law being the utility of a network is the square of the number of users of that network. And so as opposed to just using um, the, the raw number, actually squaring it, or there are, there are different ways to approach Metcalfe's Law. So if you search price to Metcalfe's Law crypto, there's a good um, blog that was written about it not too long ago. And then um, turning to the supply side, I'm doing some work right now with Crypto Lab Capital, specifically lo looking at network value to hash rate. Um, but this capital expenditure to network value, what this gets at is um, if you look at the hash rate, say, of Bitcoin, you can divide Bitcoin's hash rate by the most common machine, which is an Antminer S9's hash rate, and you get from that division the number of machines, the minimum number of machines connected to the network. Um, and once you have the number of machines connected to the network, you know the, the, the market price for those machines, and you multiply those two, and you get the capital expenditure. And um, I haven't run that, that number for a while, um, but it was around 500 million um, a few months ago, and it wouldn't surprise me if it's over a billion now, given how the hash rate's been growing. Once you have that capital expenditure to create the, 